I'd like to begin by posing a theoretical question. Are we living in a black hole? Once this presentation is completed, you'll be better able to contemplate that on your own. Now, first, um, I'll be going over how a black hole is defined. Then I will touch on some of the uh, science in interstellar. And then finally, I will conclude with how it all pertains to our universe. So let's start with the basics. What is a black hole? It is most commonly defined as an object whose escape velocity exceeds that of the speed of light. Now, black holes are formed as a result of a certain type of stellar evolution. So when a star dies, it takes one of three courses of development depending on its mass. The least massive will degenerate to a white dwarf, as our sun will in the very distant future. The second least massive will become a neutron star. And the third, sometimes a star can become so massive that when it collapses, the inward force of gravity exceeds any outward force then that a star can provide, thus forming a black hole. So let's go over some helpful vocabulary. Here is a diagram. <laughs> Don't worry, there's no test at the end of this. First, the event horizon is represented by this circle. This is the spherical boundary within which nothing can escape. So even light, if directed outwards from within the boundary, will turn back toward the center of the black hole. That is because light is comprised of particles called photons which carry mass. Next, that spot in the middle represents the singularity, which is in fact the point at the center of the black hole at which gravity becomes infinitely strong. This is where Einstein's theory of general relativity likely breaks down and new physics might apply. General relativity states, basically, that the gravitational attractive forces can be visualized by picturing four-dimensional space-time as being warped by the masses that lie within it. Now, it is called space-time because the more massive the object, the greater the dent, and the greater the time dilation. So the time dilation is how a distant observer will, uh, more time will pass for him in relation to a given amount of time pad passed for he who is near to the object. Understanding the time dilation, you can see that this is how your middle school teacher misinformed you slightly because uh, he, I bet he told you that time passes at the same rate for all observers. Ha ha. Now, I really just wanted a trampoline. No. So, given that a basketball did not suffice, I will be representing a mass in space. So, as you can see, um, my, uh, my, the dent that I am creating in the fabric this represents my gravitational force. And one of these marbles I can use to represent how objects can get trapped into orbit, so to speak. Of course, this all depends on their trajectory and speed, so bear with me for a moment. Huh? Fugitive marble. Anyway, so in terms of black holes, their dents are so, they're so insanely dense that they extend infinitely downward into the fabric of time, practically ripping the fabric. Thus is why we call it a hole. So now we have the gravity gradient, which is the rate of change of gravitational force over a distance or that, and also the trajectory of an object. So basically, the curve that object A would follow as a result of A's initial angle and velocity at which it approaches object B, or in this case, the black hole. What would happen if one were to, say, get too close to a black hole by some means? Well, I will tell you. First off, well, several things would happen. First off, because of the black hole's intense uh, pull of gravity, the force would be significantly 
uh, greater at your feet, say, than at your head because of the magnitude of the gravity gradient. Because of this fact, your body would physically become infinitely elongated in a process called spaghettification, <laughs> once again. Now that has to be one of the greatest words, I must say. Of course, because of the, you know, the sheer force of, of the black hole, you'd be crushed before you'd be able to experience this process. However, in some supermassive black holes, the gravity gradient could be so small that it is practically indiscernible. Therefore, spaghettification would not occur. Keep that in mind, refer back to it later. So now I'd like to show a short video about that, with, that depicts what it would look like if one were to fall into a black hole. Um, this was supercomputer generated by Dr. Andrew Hamilton of Colorado University. There are certain zones for a black hole. First, as you're approaching it, you'll experience the green zone, which is the safe zone in which stable orbits around the hole are actually possible. The second is the yellow zone, where orbits are, it is possible to maintain an orbit, but it would be unstable, which basically means that any deviation from the path, however slight, would result in you either pummeling toward the black hole or shooting off away from it. Then there's the orange zone, where unless you have a constant force pushing you away, you will fall into the black hole, concluding with the event horizon. Has anyone here seen the movie Interstellar? Awesome, great. Now, I bet a lot of you were wondering about you know, the, the scientific aspects of it, right? Maybe? Well, I was interested. So, <laughs> given that um, theoretical physicist Kip Thorne was on the scene, uh, needless to say, it was generally very accurate. Um, those, for those of you who don't know, Interstellar is a science fiction movie about a man who leaves planet or Earth to explore space and planets potentially able to support human life. I mean, can't say I wouldn't do the same, right? <laughs> and so as I understood it, there was talk of a planet orbiting a black hole, which, as I said before, was possible. However, this is only possible if it were to initially approach the hole at a precise uh, angle, at a precise velocity, etc. Needless to say, it would also have to be outside the event horizon, lest it get hopelessly crushed. Um, however, if they are pushing the idea that one hour is equivalent to several years on Earth, the planet must be extremely close to the event horizon. Yeah. However, this is impossible because the closest possible stable orbit around a black hole must be the distance of at least three lengths of the event horizon, the radius of the event horizon away. So, here's the singularity. Radius of the event horizon must be at least three. So it's gotta be here if you wanna maintain a stable orbit for a planet, or anything for that matter. However, yet still here at this, the most extreme time dilation, the ratio is still two thirds. Meaning that, for example, if uh, 30 minutes were to pass on this planet, that would be equivalent to 45 minutes on Earth. And one hour is equivalent to an hour and a half. So on the topic of time travel, Interstellar proposes the idea of a tesseract, a three-dimensional construction of the fourth dimension, in this case, time, presenting itself at the singularity of the black hole. Now, this would be impossible if it were a stationary black hole, because as uh, previously mentioned, their singularities are but single points and require an impossible velocity to escape. However, uh, rotating black holes, their singularities are theorized to be in the shape of a ring, so that if it were large enough, in theory, one could potentially pass through. Some find this idea to be compatible with the concept of a wormhole, through which one could pass and get from one point in space to another instantaneously. However, this requires something called exotic matter that carries negative energy, which is thus far merely a hypothesis. Let's talk about the end. According to scientists, there are three potential fates of the universe. Our universe has a finite amount of matter, so 
understanding how much we have currently can determine its end. First possibility, as represented by the purple, is that our uni universe is continually expanding. That is to say that it is not dense enough now, nor will it ever be, and therefore matter will ceaselessly reform and spread out. Second possibility, represented by the green, is that um, our universe is just dense enough. So the expansion rate will eventually level off at a certain point and cease to a halt at the end of time, whatever that might be. Third possibility, it's represented by the blue, is commonly known as the big crunch. So this is what happens if our, our universe gets so dense that the mutual gravitational attractive force of all objects act on one another at once, instantaneously coming together to form a singular blob of mass. Awesome. <laughs> Thus, going back to a singularity and sort of repeating the cycle, back to where it started before the Big Bang. Unfortunately, humans have not lived long enough to discern a change in the expansion rate of the universe, so we will likely not know for sure until much later. So now I return back to my original question. Are we living in a black hole? Well, it does seem entirely possible. What if, in a past universe, black holes consumed more mass than they radiated and swallowed everything, forming one monster black hole? Perhaps that is all our universe is comprised of. That is to say that everything in our universe is, within the event horizon, gradu gradually approaching the singularity. But since we're all approaching it at the same rate, and that all movement in space is relative, we would never be able to tell. Additionally, because of the massiveness of this black hole, the, gradient, the gravity gradient would be so small, it would practically be insignificant. Hence, spaghettification would not occur. I mean, how could we tell, right? This could potentially satisfy any of the three fates of the universe, because we truly do not know what happens to matter at the singularity. So, how this uh, pertains to me. Well, I've always enjoyed uh, astrophysics and mathematics, the definite parts and the ambiguous. Um, I've been attending the MIT Splash program for the past few years that is open to high school students and formerly middle school students. Uh, you can take courses on campus from MIT faculty, students, and alumnos. Um, from, you know, black holes to circular Gallifreyan to immunology to fractals. Um, I'd encourage anyone to attend. Additionally, there's so much more to black holes that I have not even touched on, and they're fascinating stuff, fascinating stuff. So I'd encourage you to check out um, Dr. Hamilton's website, if you'd like, or talk to me afterwards. <laughs> credit where credit is due. <laughs> and end on a bad pun when in doubt. Thank you very much. <laughs>